Good morning. Aloha. Kaya. My name is Shelley James. I'm your Oceania representative for Tadwick. Um, I'm also the collections manager for the Western Australian Herbarium in Perth, Western Australia. So it's great to be here and see all your smiling, happy, awake faces. Um, it is my great pleasure and honour to introduce uh, Dr. Richard Pyle, our second plenary speaker for Tadwick 2022. He's the Senior Curator of Ichthyology and the Director of the Centre for Exploration of Coral Reef Ecosystems, XCOR, at the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, a fantastic place, if I do say so myself. Richard's been an active member of Tadwick since uh, the 1990s, so a fair amount of time. He's got a lot of experience. Uh, he really enjoys the balance of being a data nerd, a fish nerd, a diving nerd, and an aquarium nerd, all of which revolve around a limitless passion for biodiversity. So I welcome Richard to the stage wearing his taxonomy hat today to present an introduction to scientific names of organisms and the taxon concepts they represent. Over to you. Thank you, Shelley. Hello, everybody. Um, so the good news is I thought I was 12 time zones out of sync, and it turns out I'm only 11 time zones out of sync. So I'll do my best to stay conscious for my own presentation here. Um, I need to give a little bit of context. So I was invited kindly to give a um, updated version of a presentation I gave at Tadwig in 2008 in Fremantle, Australia, just sort of summarizing taxonomy. Um, I don't want to call it taxonomy for dummies because I've never met a dummy at a Tadwick conference. Everybody here is not a dummy. Um, but I, what I will refer to it is maybe a um, sort of an overview of taxonomy for non-taxonomic specialists. So for my fellow taxonomy nerds and code warriors, forgive me, you're going to find some stuff in here that oversimplifies things that uh, you're probably going to quibble with come up and we'll duke it out during the break. Um, but for the most part, what I want to do is just give a broad overviewing context of how taxonomy works, especially for developers and, and non-taxonomists. Um, so let me start with what is taxonomy. Now, when I was in graduate school, we had these sort of snarky definitions for each of our different fields that we worked in. So for instance, physiology was the study of dying animals because my physiology friends used to study things that were just on the verge of death. And, and my wife, who's an ethologist uh, behavior, you know, the, 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 that was the study of terrified animals because um, there were always things in aquariums and whatnot. And it's kind of a Heisenberg uncertainty principle of science because you're impacting the organism you're studying. Um, but my personal favorite was ecology which was the laborious task of proving the obvious. And I think that'll resonate with a lot of you. Um, and in my field, of course, was taxonomy. So our definition was the perpetual reclassification of misnamed species uh, with emphasis on perpetual to give us job security into the future. And my, my graduate student colleague, Randy Kosaki, put it a little more bluntly, taxonomy is a necessary evil. <laughs> All right. so. I'm going to go back sort of do a little bit of the history. Um, prior to the mid 18th century, naturalists didn't have a common system for naming biodiversity, for putting labels on the units of biodiversity. So early uh, literature included these sort of phrase names of organisms, right? So we have the unbranched fern, long and narrow, leaves articulate at the base, and as opposed to another fern, uh, long and narrow leaves, leafy at the base. So this is how taxonomists tried to refer to units of nature uh, in a not so consistent way. Um, thankfully, in the mid uh, 18th century, uh, this guy came along, Carl Linnaeus, and came with, up with two uh, pivotal landmark publications. This is one of them, Species Plantarum in 1753, a catalog of all the plants of the world then known. And then a few years later, the 10th edition of Systema Naturae, a catalog of all the animals then known. Both of these works represent the respective starting points of formal scientific nom nomenclature for each of those disciplines. Um, uh, it, it wasn't just the, the, the system he created of, of classification involving uh, kingdoms and orders and, and uh, uh, genera and classes and species and things, but also he introduced the idea of a binomial nomenclature. That is a consistent way that all naturalists could refer to biodiversity using a two-part naming system consisting of a genus and the species 
together combined being unique. And it's amazing that we still use that convention today over 250 years later. There aren't many standards in science that live that long. And this is one of them. It's obviously been modified over the years. So in its modern incarnation, so this is the first of several slides like this, which is in direct violation of the instruction to authors of don't put text heavy slides. Um, you won't be tested on this, don't read it. It's just mostly for people who wanna download it and get some of the details. But these are the three major codes of nomenclature. Um, the top one there is the uh, International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, uh, Fungi and Plants. And my apologies in advance to my good friends who are mycologists and phycologists. I will henceforth refer to this as the botanical code or botanical practice. I'm sorry. I know that fungi are not plants. I know that algae are not plants. And I know they're all covered by the same code. But you know, I've only got so much time here, so I can't always refer to all three at the same time. Um, and then the second one, the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. I put ICZN in quotes because those of us who are on the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature use that acronym to refer to the commission. The C word is commission, but a lot of people use that same acronym with the C being the code, ICZN code. It's a little bit fingernails on a chalkboard to me, but that's okay. I'll, I'll get over it. Consider it our contribution to reducing the number of acronyms in our world. Um, and then there's the, the International Code of Nomenclature of Prokaryotes, used to be of bacteria. Um, uh, uh, these other three codes at the bottom are other nomenclatural codes for viruses, cultivated plants, and phylogenetic nomenclature. Uh, they're not as rooted in the Linnaean system as the main three, and most biodiversity data that we in the Tadwig world deal with are probably dealing with scientific names involving those first three codes. All right, so let's understand a little bit about the difference between scientific names and taxonomic concepts. So we're in the Shakespeare room, so a, an oblique reference to Shakespeare, what's in a name? Um, but the real question is, what is a name? So if I gave you this list right here, and I asked how many names are up there, well, depends on what you mean by a name. So the obvious answer is, well, there's 13. There's 13 unique text strings up there. So that must mean there are 13 different names. But to a botanist, that's not quite the case. Actually, not all of these would be considered different names in the botanical context, because the introduction of that subgenus is thought more of a, a difference in classification. So there's really only nine unique names from a botanical perspective. And if you go to the zoological perspective, there's actually only four names. Um, all of the rest of these things on this list are just different combinations of those four units. Now, to be fair, not all zoologists reduce it that far into just those four names. A lot of zoologists have a view that's similar to what I just showed for the botanical view case. But if you look at the code of nomenclature, one of the main differences between the botany view and the, and the zoological view is that botanists treat different combinations of the same species in a different genus as a nomenclatural act and therefore a different name. But in zoology, those are not considered nomenclatural acts. So they're more like classifications in the same way that botanists use the subgenera as classifications. So depending on what perspective you're looking at, there is different numbers of names out there. And of course, databases around the world have all been generated with these different perspectives in mind. So we have a hard time dealing with databases where each record, each unique identifier assigned to a name isn't necessarily in parity with other databases that use a slightly different definition of a name. So that's one of the challenges we face is just what is a name. And then synonyms and homonyms, uh, you'll hear a lot about these if you go to taxonomic discussions. So synonyms are examples where you have multiple names for the same organism. So here's two scientific names for two obviously different fishes. Um, it turns out that the one on the right is the juvenile and the one on the left is the adult. So they were later discovered to be the same species. Um, and therefore they are we now have two names for the same species. One of them, the older name in this case, Pomacanthus imperator, is the name we now use for this species. And the other name that was given for the juvenile is considered a synonym. So we have two names for the same species. So another case is the same name for multiple organisms. This is what we call homonymy or homonyms. So here's an example, also an angelfish. Um, two species in the same genus, both bright yellow, both discovered a name by different naturalists. Both thought they were being clever and choosing the Latin name for yellow to refer to the species. And so they ended up both having the same name, even though they're different species. Um, so when that happens, 
we can't have two different species sharing the same name. So that's what we call a homonym. And the rules of the code have you replace that name with a different name. And, and then the original homonymous name now becomes a synonym of that, that second species. So these are more kind of complications we deal with trying to track how organisms and their names change over time. And then authorship's a whole nother bag of worms. Differences between zoological and botanical, mycological, phycological practices. So in zoology, we typically put the author of the author's name and the year after the species. And then if the species changes genus, we put that in parentheses to indicate that that was not the original combination, but we acknowledge that it has changed since then. Um, and then in botany, they generally don't put the year. They just put an abbreviation, a standard abbreviation. They have a system of standard abbreviated names. And as I mentioned before, in the botanical code, changing a genus to, a, I mean, a species to a new genus is a, is a nomenclatural act. So they track the authorship of which author made that nomenclatural change of moving the species into a different genus. There's a not common situation, but in zoology, where you have an author who names a new species based on the work of an earlier author, there'll be an X author. You don't see this very often. So this would be Randall as the author of the name, but he based his work on Thompson. Botanists do the same thing, but they reverse the order. So it's the same concept, you know, just because it's not confusing enough. Um, and then in zoological world, when we get into subspecies, we only have one rank below species. It's subspecies, so we don't need to qualify it. Everyone knows in zoology that that third name is a subspecies, and then it's got an author. Um, in the botanical world, there are multiple ranks, like subspecies, varieties, forms, and they're considered uh, nomenclatural changes as well. So the author who made the change is also credited. So these are just some of the ways that the authorships differ between the different uh, practices. The authors are not part of the name. That part's really clear, but they're, they're there to help disambiguate homonyms. They're there to help you track down the original names. And speaking of original names, this word basionym is actually used in botany, not so much in zoology, but what it refers to is the relationship between a subsequent combination and its original combination. So in this case, it was originally Antheus ventralis, and then it was later changed to Pseudanthius ventralis. Antheus ventralis is the basionym, the link between that new combination and the earlier combination is a basionym link. So same with this other species. We don't use this word in zoology very much, but the same concept still exists. We acknowledge that there are subsequent combinations that refer back to original combinations. So, so that word basionym uh, comes into play there. And if all that's not confusing enough, we have some other differences in terminology. In zoology, we use the word available, meaning it's a name that is available for use under the code of nomenclature because it meets the criteria for its existence. And in the botanical, mycological, phycological world, they use the word validly published to mean the same thing. In zoology, we use the word valid to actually mean two different things. In fact, on the commission, we're sort of teasing those two meanings apart right now. Um, and in the botanical world, in some contexts, the valid means the correct name, which means sort of the code correct name, as opposed to, in some cases, it means the accepted name, which is the subjectively decided upon um, lumper versus splitter synonymy situation. I won't get into too much detail. In zoology, we refer to things called senior synonyms and junior synonyms. Senior synonyms simply means when you have two names referring to the same organism, one of them has priority that's the correct name to use. That's the senior synonym. And then the junior synonym are all the other synonyms that are subordinate to that in priority and therefore treated as synonyms when they're considered the same species. And in the botanical world, we also have something a little bit different, homotypic synonyms versus heterotypic synonyms. So if you have this list right here, the one where ventralis is the same epithet, it, that's a homotypic synonym. But when you're saying that hawaiiensis is also a synonym of ventralis, those are two different epithets, that's a heterotypic synonym. So more confusion. All right, this is an old slide. So apologies to everyone. I probably don't have your correct logo up there anymore. I'm probably missing some key logos. I was going to add the disco logo, but I forgot. But what this slide is supposed to represent is that out in biodiversity land, we have lots of digital data all over the places, museum collections, aggregators, uh, nomenclators, catalogs, publication world, lots and lots and lots and lots of sources of digital biodiversity data. And they're all heed together with each other 
using scientific names. That's what links all this biodiversity together and gives it all context. So here's an example of a species name. And then here's some examples of variants of that same species name, different spellings, different abbreviations, with and without authorships, scattered in all these different data sources. And that's just the same combination. If you get into uh, synonyms, I mean, the same epithet, if you get into synonyms, you get this whole plethora of other text strings. So using text strings to try to bridge all the data together and make sense out of it all has been you know, challenging for decades. And that's one of the things we've been wrestling here in the Tadwig world for a long time. So if you wanna just find all the information that's out there on the bluefish, you've got a lot of text strings you gotta use in order to try to hunt all that stuff down. So that's, that's a quick summary of the confusion of the world of naming. Now, what about the world of taxonomy? Um, so, so besides just the names, there are the taxa. I'm not gonna go into these in too much detail, but these are different words. Potential taxon, I'm going to come back to in a little bit. Walter Berenson, who's here, um, is, is one of the founders of a lot of this thinking that you're hearing about now. Um, but basically, these labels are referred to what's a taxon or a taxonomic concept. So the word that kind of unites them all that we in the biodiversity informatics community are sort of gathering around that, again, Walter was sort of a champion of is this word circumscription. These are three different definitions for what a circumscription means. But what it really means is a circumscribed set of individual organisms. So those yellow dots all represent individual organisms. The white ovals encircling them is the taxon or a taxon concept. And the idea is that a taxon is a placeholder, an abstract placeholder representing all of these organisms that, uh, that fall within that taxon. All right, this is one of my favorite diagrams from uh, Etow et al. In, in 2001 to illustrate some of the problems with this and Nomen Curator. And, and the idea is that on the left there, you guy with the beard, he's your taxonomist, he's your expert, he's publishing a paper talking about some taxon, and he's got a very clear vision in his head what he means when he refers to a taxon through this complicated set of publications and printed strings and names and cited specimens. And eventually the reader, the poor guy there on the right goes, taxon? We're not really sure how much those two notions of the taxon are in line with each other, right? There's a little bit of fuzziness between the mind, the taxon that existed in the mind of the taxonomist and the, and the, uh, and the taxon that existed in the person reading that taxonomic work and trying to interpret it. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, so I'll kind of summarize this complexity of what is a taxon uh, with a, a version of that, which is what is a species. Now, if you're a biologist, you know that's one of those questions that has not yet been answered and probably never will be answered because biologists love to argue with each other and we can't all agree what is a species. Um, so let's go back to the origin, so to speak. So here is uh, Charles Darwin. And he wrote about this in The Origin of Species. Hence, in determining whether a form should be ranked as a species or a variety, the opinion of naturalists having sound judgment and wide experience seems the only guide to follow. Now, before I had read Origin of Species, when I was a graduate student, at one of the very first public presentations I gave, I was challenged with a question at the end of my presentation on hybrids. And off the cuff, I came up with this definition of what a species is, which is essentially the same thing Darwin is saying, is that a species is what a taxonomist says. And if you keep reading Darwin, he goes on to say, you know, we must, however, in many cases, decide by a majority of naturalists for a few well-ranked, well-marked and well-known variant varieties uh, can be named which have not been ranked as species by at least uh, some competent judges, meaning people will disagree, but the majority in generally wins. So as a PhD, after I got my dissertation finished, I read the full origin of species and refined my own definition to a species as what a community of taxonomists says it is. So even though it sounds kind of snarky and it is kind of snarky, it's actually de facto how taxonomy works. Right. I mean, different taxonomists have different views on what a species is or should be or, or how it should be defined. Um, and and uh, we don't want to confuse it with biological species concept versus phylogenetic species concept and so on. But de facto, the way this works is that taxonomy is followed by the majority of taxonomists who choose to recognize species as distinct. So in a summary, looking at this world of taxonomy and this world of nomenclature, taxonomy goes back a long time to Aristotle. 
It involves a circumscription of organisms within taxa, involves the classification of taxa into a structured hierarchy, and involves hypotheses of phylogenetic relationships, and involves splitting and lumping and synonymizing and all that sort of stuff. Whereas the nomenclatural world had its origins in the 1750s with Linnaeus, it's all about structured rules for forming the actual names that you apply to organisms, rules for establishing new names, rules for establishing priority when different names are competing for synonymy, and rules that are designed to prevent homonyms. Um, and now I've drawn those as two ovals that don't overlap, they actually do overlap, and they overlap in one very specific point, and that's a type specimen. Now, that's a whole nother lecture, but the thing that it's really important to understand is there's only one objective link between any scientific name and any actual living organism, and that is the name-bearing type. And, uh, and, and that's a critical point, which I'm going to come back to in my presentation tomorrow, if you have a chance to, to see that. Um, but, but people don't realize that all the other organisms on planet Earth that are not name-bearing types are associated with scientific names, not explicitly via nomenclature, but implicitly via taxonomy. That is, it's somebody's taxonomic judgment. There's no absolute truth to whether or not a particular organism should be labeled as such, unless it's a name-bearing type, then you have an objective link. All right, so this is Tadwig. So we talk about informatics and data modeling and things like that. So I'm gonna shift over into that. Another forbidden slide of too much information. Basically, this is just to say that in the nomenclatural side of informatics over the last decade or so, um, the different realms of, of nomenclature have gotten into online registration. Um, each one of these is its own full presentation about where it is. Uh, prokaryotes have been registering their things since 1980. Now I put registration in quotes because actually the way they started doing it was in a published paper journal where they'd sort of list them all. So it wasn't really a database the way we think of registration, but now there's a list of prokaryotic names um, that's databased and maintained. Zoology has Zoobank. Um, the mycological folks were the first in, in the uh, international code for uh, uh, algae, fungi, and plants to start requiring registration for new scientific names. And botany is currently experimenting it with it right now on the IPNI website, uh, co uh, collaboration of Q and Australian National Herbarium. But the point is that nomenclatural side in digitization and information modeling is beginning to sort of gel into this sort of nomenclatural registration system. We are getting very informatic in our backbone to nomenclature. And those are just some of the websites that I was just referring to. All right. Now, data standards, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. Again, each one of those is a whole presentation in itself. We obviously have Darwin Core. We have uh, 60 terms in the bag of terms within the organized within the taxon class with Darwin Core. Uh, ABCD obviously has a good structure for uh, for uh, names and nomenclature, NCBI taxonomy are trying to, or have off and on tried to create a, a proper ontology for this stuff. Um, and then there's the taxon concepts, uh, taxon concept transfer schema, TCS, which was first released version 1.0 in, in 2005 uh, as part of a Tadwick and is currently version 2.0 is still under active development. It's one of the task groups uh, that Deb referred to going on actively here in Tadwick. And those are some links. All right, so now I'm going to kind of get back into the nitty gritty of how this stuff works going forward, kind of where we're at right now and where we're heading right now in terms of getting informatic structured all these names and concepts. And this is what we call taxonomic name usages, TNUs, which are kind of like the universal units of taxonomy and nomenclature. All right, so what is a TNU? All right. Keeping on the Shakespearean context, we're in the Shakespeare room here, continuing on that, a TNU by other name would, I tried to think of something clever about smell is sweet, but I couldn't come up with it in the TNU context, so I just paraphrased it there. But all these words here and more that I'm not even showing are words that kind of float around the same general idea. They don't all mean exactly the same thing. Each one of these has a slightly different variant to it, but what they refer to is that taxon names whether or not they're nomenclatural things that codes govern or just taxonomic assertions, 
they exist in the context of some sort of documentation, usually a publication or something like that. They're not just floating out there in nature. They have to be documented in some way. And so all nomenclatural acts and all taxonomic judgments and opinions at some form or another pass through a taxonom taxon or taxonomic name usage. So let me get a little more specific on what one of these TNU things is. All right, we start with a reference, okay? So most people think of references as being like publications. That's the most common place where this information is stored, but it's actually any static document source. Uh, you know, even single copy documents like specimen labels could be considered a reference, field notebooks, correspondence, things like that. Um, the keyboard there is static. That is, it has to be something that's unchanging. Like a dynamic database is not the origin of TNUs because it can be changed and altered 100 years from now. It may have different values than it did on the day you first looked at it. Whereas the idea of a TNU is once it's minted, it is what it is forever. Okay, so here's an example of a reference publication. All right, so what's a taxon name usage? It's a usage of a taxon name at the epithet level, and I'll come back to that in a second, within the context of a reference. So here's our reference. We go to page 181 of that reference, and lo and behold, there's a scientific name, and it gets its first record as a taxon name usage with its own unique identifier, one, two, three, pointer to the, what reference this TNU lives in, what the name string was used, and what rank it was used at, all right? This is a very special case of a TNU, okay? So see how it says new genus there. This wasn't just any old use of this Bellana perca. This was the first use of it. This was a proposal as a brand new scientific name. That's a special case of protonym, of, of taxon name usage called protonym. Protonyms are taxon name usages, but they're the subset of taxon name usages that represents the original proposal of new scientific names, okay? so. If we have a foreign key in this row here, back to protonym ID, you'll see that's recursive to itself. That's the definition of a protonym. I am a TNU that links to myself as the protonym. All right, and then another foreign key we have is whether or not it's treated as valid. I won't dwell on that, but that's just whether or not this publication regarded that as a valid taxon or as a synonym of another taxon. Okay, so on the next page, we have another taxon name usage right up there at the top. It's also a protonym, it's a new species, but this time it's not Bellana perca, it's Chabanadi, the species name. So here we have another TNU record with Chabanadi. Now remember I said these are epithet level, which means that that full combination up there, Bellana perca Chabanadi actually has two TNUs. The first one for Bellana perca within this reference, and then the second one being a protonym for Chabanadi within the same reference. So again, we have a recursive protonym link and a recursive valid, but we also have a hierarchical parent. This is where we get our combination from by walking through a series of taxon name usage instances. So this is another publication chosen totally at random, um, naming a new species. And so here's another species it's a protonym because this publication, this Baldwin and Smith publication, created this brand new name for the first time. So it is the protonym. 345 is the protonym crosslink, treated as valid. But what about that parent? How come that parent doesn't point back to the Bellana perca that's 123? Well, actually, because specifically, Baldwin and Smith placed Bellana perca in the Baldwin and Smith treatment of Bellana perca, not the of Fowler and Beans. So Baldwin and Smith get their own Bellana perca reference for the genus, and its protonym link does link back to say that this is a subsequent usage of a name that was originally created in that previous publication. Now, again, this is a whole presentation. I won't dwell into it, but the point is every publication we deal with is loaded with TNUs. You can index them. You can catalog them. We have the Global Names Usage Bank to try to record all of these things. We have getting up to a million of them already indexed. Um, but these TNUs are sort of like the least common denominator of all things that happen both in nomenclature and in taxonomy. So I'm going to walk through a very concrete example just to hammer this whole point home and how it all works. And I'm going to divide the world up into two parts, the real world and the world of taxonomy, which are very different worlds. So in the real world, fish live in the sea. Okay, we, we acknowledge that. Now, people go out and they see these fish and then they catch them, kill a couple of them, put them in jars of alcohol in a museum. So a very tiny subset of those fish that live in the sea end up in a museum collection somewhere. 
And then a taxonomist will come along, look at the reserves and go, oh my gosh, this is a brand new species. And so they'll pick one specimen, call it the holotype, the type specimen of that species. They'll publish a paper and name it as a brand new species, okay? So Snyder in 1904 named this new species based on uh, one holotype. And then you get this TNU. Now I should explain a little bit there. What you're seeing there is the name, Holocanthus fisheri, Snyder 1904. The first Snyder 1904 is the nomenclatural author. SEC, SEC is a convention proposed by Walter Berenson in the 1990s as a way of sort of saying sensu or according to, it's short for segunda. It's normally not capitalized. I've just capitalized it to make it easier to see, but it's Snyder's usage of the name fisheri within Snyder himself, okay? So that's how you know it's a protonym because before and after the sec are the same reference. And that TNU is sort of a placeholder reference to not just the holotype, not just the specimens that Snyder examined, but all the organisms Snyder would have included within that taxon concept. So it's sort of like a pointer to the entire circumscription of the concept that Snyder had in mind. All right, more fish live in the sea. More are collected and killed and put in jars of alcohol. Another taxonomist comes along. Oh my God, it's a new species. I'm going to name it. So Norman here names this new species. We got the same thing. We got Holocanthus acanthops, Norman, Sec Normans, Norman's concept of Norman's named species. Now we have Jordan coming along and just stirring the pot a little because he decided that we need a new genus name. And I'm going to name as type species of that genus Fisheri. Um, so, so this this new genus called Ziphopops, and a type species is is essentially the same thing as a type specimen for a species name. A type genus is the anchor point for a genus name. So Jordan said, "I think we need a whole new genus to represent these guys," and he changed the name. Right. So now it's no longer Holocanthus fisheri; it's Ziphopops fisheri. All right. So there's Zipophops fisheri, Snyder in parentheses, because it's no longer the original combination. Sec Jordan, that means Jordan's opinion of what this taxon was. And he included in it the homotypic synonym, the same epithet, but with a different combination of that other TNU. All right. So, and then the red ring represents the fact that Jordan had the exact same circumscription concept that uh, Snyder did. Okay. More fish live in the sea. They get discovered, collected, new species gets named third species now, and essentially you're seeing this pattern repeat. We have this protonym, this flavicauda named by Fraser Bruner, including a type specimen, but inclusive of a whole bunch of other organisms that were collected and uncollected. He also put it in yet another genus. So now we have more homotypic synonyms here, uh, where we have you know now three names, homotypic synonyms altogether, uh, representing what Fraser Bruner thought was fisheri. Right. And then he also talked about acanthops and acknowledged it as the same species concept, but just moved the genus around. So you can see how this is, goes over time as new publications, new taxonomists come along and decide the previous generation didn't quite have it right. So we're going to change it up a little bit. All right. So now I don't know if you noticed, but on the lower right corner, more exploration reveals that this this species is actually all over the Pacific in totally different areas. And so when you look at the variation, there's really no difference between these two species. Those two individuals are different, but there's sort of continuous variation between them. So a taxonomist comes along named Pyle on his PhD dissertation, decides that actually these two things should be considered the same species. And so now I have a little different formula there where we've now got heterotypic synonym. Um, and I won't go into the formula up there explaining what it means, but it's essentially what we're saying is now we're joining two names together. Now we've got a circumscription that includes two type specimens. So that's how we end up with a heterotypic synonym. And then Pyle also acknowledged uh, this, this uh, other species over here. So I'm going to run through this again very quickly. It's the exact same example, but just putting it in a geographic context and showing you how these records in a database are generated, right? So Fisher discovered in Hawaii, as it turns out, a, a type specimen is designated, a new species is named. So we have a new reference, Snyder 1904, a new taxon name usage, Snyder's usage of Fisheri, and then a new protonym because it, he's creating a new name at the same time, all right? Then over here in the Western Indian Ocean, Norman comes along. Same thing, names a new species. That's why we have a new protonym, new taxon name usage. Um, Jordan comes along. He doesn't change anything of the layout. All he does is say, yeah, I get Fisher. I agree. It's the same. I'm just putting in a different genus. Um, 
And then we have um, a fish discovered in, in Southeast Asia that Fraser Bruner names, and he says, okay, this is a different species. I'm giving it a new name. Therefore, we have a third protonym. And, and then another publication, oh, he's also acknowledging that fisheri is the same. So all those rings over there mean that so far all the taxonomists agree that that population in Hawaii is the same taxon. All right. And then he also expanded the range of this other one. So he didn't really change the concept, except that he did expand the range. So maybe he did the, the, expand the concept. We're not sure. And then off Taiwan, another species gets discovered in name. This is Shen. Um, he calls it Cotoxanthorus. He makes no mention of the other two species. So we're not really sure how he's comparing it to the other ones. Um, then Alan comes along and says, you know what? That Cotoxanthorus thing, it's the same species as Flavicata. So he sinks it into synonymy. And now he's got a concept that includes two type specimens up there. Um, that, that's, that's how he gets his heterotypic synonymy. All right. Then more work is done. Fishes are found all over the Pacific. And then Smith comes along and he says, well, you know, this species Flavicata, it lives all over the Pacific. So that's really just a range extension. It's a bigger, bigger circumscription, but there's no real nomenclatural changes happening here. Although there's some ambiguity because Smith never mentioned Cotoxanthurus. So we don't know if Smith would have drawn his circle like that or if Smith would have included that other one. That's a little bit ambiguous. And that's just, I put that in there to remind us that taxonomists do not have a track record for recording information perfectly. All right, more fish, understatement of the conversation. Okay, so um, more fish are discovered. Pyle comes along, does his dissertation, sinks all that into one species. So now there's only, that one species now has three type specimens within it. There's one in the, the acanthops is avoided any controversy up until now, although Pyle did extend the range a little bit. And then there's actually another publication after Pyle that says, you know what? I think these are all the same species. So uh, Schindler came along and sunk them all together. So the point is, this is why taxonomy changed. This is why the perpetual reclassification of misnamed species goes on and on, because taxonomists have different opinions about how all these things should be structured. Um, and the way you can start trying to capture that information, at least getting identifiers onto things that are useful for comparison purposes, is creating these TNUs, which are links between references and protonyms. All right, so let's come back to this thing. So how does this solve this conundrum of our, of our, you know, of our scholarly professor taxonomist who's got a clear idea of a taxon in his head, trying to compare it to the poor data consumer, trying to understand if they're thinking of it the same way? How do we know if these are the same or not? How do they know if these thought bubbles actually represent the same things? Well, it's helpful to understand how just to sort of classify these differences. How are we doing on time, by the way? Okay, good. I'm getting near the end. So there are these things called RCC5 relationships that set theory stuff. So if you consider two circumscriptions, right? Here we have two circumscriptions with non-overlapping. There's no individual organism shared between those two circumscriptions. This is, this is the way we would say this is, is circumscription one excludes circumscription two. That is, there's no overlap at all between them, no shared members of either set. And then you can have this situation where all of circumscription two is included within circumscription one. I show them as green dots because those green dots are in both circumscriptions. They're in the blue circumscription and in the yellow circumscription. That's why they're green, blue and yellow are green. So, so the idea is that this is a relationship where C1 includes C2. And then there's the inverse of that where C1 is included in C2. That's just, in that case, circumscription two is the broader set and circumscription one is just a subset within that broader set. And then there's this other one where there are overlaps. This is where it's getting complicated. Some of them are shared between the two circumscriptions, but neither one is fully included when the other. Each circumscription has its own that's outside. And then the one we're really aiming for is what we call congruent. That is, both circumscriptions have exactly the same set of members within them. And so when we come back to these guys, We'd like to believe that the taxonomist, when he was talking about a taxon, is adequately communicating it to the data consumer so that they can both have a shared understanding of what that taxon means, what the scope of that taxon. We want those two ideas of the taxon to be congruent. But the reality is that's often not the case. Sometimes they may have dis dissimilar understandings of what they're talking about. This is where miscommunication happens, and this is where it gets really challenging to cross-link data in a semantic, meaningful way across all of our data sets, because we have this problem of 
imprecise communication happening between taxonomists and another taxonomist or any other data consumer. This is the problem, this is the challenge we're facing right now. And it comes back to this notion of circumscription. Now, as I mentioned, Walter is the one who sort of really pushed this idea that a circumscription is what the taxon is. But the problem he and others and all of us have faced is like, what level of granularity do you define those members? Like my, you know, one idea, the broadest idea is that all those yellow dots are all the organisms living, recently dead, and yet to be born that would be included within the taxon. That's the broadest sense of it, right? The vast, vast, vast majority of those yellow dots have never been seen by a human. They lived out their lives in nature and they died, they got eaten, whatever. No human ever saw them, but they still would have been included in this abstract notion of the concept that taxonomists had, right? So the taxonomist goes on a reef, sees 50 fish, collects four of them. One of them is a holotype. The taxonomist mind included not just the holotype, not just the four collected specimens, but all the ones he saw on the reef and all the ones he didn't see. But if he saw them, he said, yeah, 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 I would have included that in there. I would. So, so that's the broadest interpretation of what the circumscription is. Every organism that's ever lived, both the ones that have already died and even the ones that haven't been born yet, they would be included within the circumscription. That's a little unwieldy and impractical. So what about only those specific organisms that have been examined or seen by a particular taxonomist? Well. Does that mean that if I cite 25 specimens in my material cited when I give my treatment and then the next guy comes along and has the same 25, but then adds one more, is that a new taxon concept? Because he's just changed the circumscription. He added one more dot. And so most intuitively people would say, no, that's not a new concept. But then how do you capture that informatically? All right, well, maybe you use it by only the name bearing uh, type specimens. And uh, spoiler alert, if you come to my talk tomorrow, I'm gonna talk more about that approach. Um, you could use populations or geography or something else to sort of try to figure out how we set those boundaries. What are those yellow dots? And when do we decide whether we have a congruent uh, concept or a different concept? So the reality is there are many different approaches and each one has different strengths and weaknesses. There's no obvious correct or, or wrong way to do it. Um, there's just different advantages and disadvantages to doing it differently. And ultimately it's a balance between granularity, how precise you wanna be in defining these concepts, utility, that is how much you wanna be able to reuse these concepts. Uh, if, if you're so precise, pretty much every TNU is its own concept, that's intractable. Um, and then also scalability, in other words, how much are other database systems going to be able to scale this and adopt this at the level of like, say, all of GBIF or all of Catalog of Life? So um, as I mentioned, you know, shameless plug, tomorrow giving a presentation in Saponi of 18, where Dave Remsen and Nicola Bailey and I have been thinking about this for about two years, and we think we have maybe a track on a solution, and I won't go into that now. I'm just going to close with, um, so why all the fuss? Why are we putting so much effort into all of this taxonomy stuff and decades of not yet figuring out how we're gonna solve this? Well, there is rationale. So taxon names are the fundamental link among virtually all biodiversity information going back 250 years. These names are what tie the information together, including in our databases today. Um, biodiversity information relates to species concepts, right? Most times when you apply a character or a distribution or anything about the biology, any kind of property, you're, you mean it to apply the whole concept, but we use text string names to label those concepts. And that's a very inadequate way of defining what that concept is. Text strings and names are difficult to cross-link because of misspellings and different orthographies and things like that. Um, different genus combinations, homonyms, synonyms, all that makes text strings suboptimal for linking biodiversity data together. Linking text string names to concepts requires source-based, literature-based approach that is TNUs, these taxon name usages, is, is what bridges names to concepts. And then the key challenge is to cross-link thousands of biodiversity data sets through taxon concepts when most of the data are, ex are labeled ex currently with taxon name strings. That's the challenge we need to overcome. So I'm going to finish off now with just sort of an example of where this kind of thought is going. Some of you may have seen this publication. Uh, it was an opinion piece in Nature in 2017 by um, um, Stephen Garnett and Liz Prestitis, bird guys, essentially saying that we need to regulate taxonomy the same way we regulate nomenclature. We have codes of nomenclature. We need a code of taxonomy because it's chaos. You know, we need to sort this out. And then 
that was immediately met with a rebuttal saying, no, you guys are nuts. That would be crazy. Taxonomy has to be free. Taxonomy has to be open. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it should be. We can't have Big Brother watching over us. And then the original authors of the, of the opinion piece came back and said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. We really, really need this because it's chaos. And then Scott Thompson and I and 180 of our friends published another paper saying, no, 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 no. We, including many ICZ and commissioners, we understand this stuff and trust us, you're wrong. And they came back and it says, well, I don't know wrong and here's why. So there's this back and forth in the literature. And then something that happens, it should happen all the time. It doesn't happen much these days is the lead authors of both our arguments got together and said, you know, we kind of agree on most of this stuff. There's just some subtle differences. And so there's this nice little article in the conversation that talks about how a scientific spat over how to name species turned to a big plus for nature. That led to funding from IUBS and a series of workshops and a publication that talks about, you know, these, these two opposing sides got together, figured out that, you know what, we really are on the same page. We all want the same thing. We published this paper on these principles and then a series of six publications that go into much more detail about what our thinking is. One of those is um, focused on sort of the informatics side of it, if you're interested of, of that. And this is, I get this as an example of something that's happening right now. This is something that's been evolving and is continuing to evolve. And it's a movement towards bringing a little bit of order to the chaos of all this taxonomy stuff. How am I doing? Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all I had. Sorry I spoke so fast. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. All right. I'm going to start with an online question first, uh, because there is one, and everyone's saying online fantastic talk. Oh. Well done. Thank you, online people. I've lost my question. Okay. So, BJ, who is uh, out there in virtual world. Mm. Hello, BJ, one of our program committee. Um, how far away are we from having taxonomy management figured out informatics wise? We're this close, which means about two or three decades. Um, no, seriously, I think I think there is a growing critical mass. I mean, in the same way that that example I gave at the end where, you know, we used to have these raging debates at Tadwig meetings about no, 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 that's not the right way to do it. I th either people just got worn out and tired and don't want to argue anymore or whatever, but there generally there's been a lull for a while. We just stopped arguing about it. And now we're beginning to sort of realize, you know, we're all kind of talking about the same thing there and, and we're gradually converging towards something. So it does feel like there's a shift of critical mass in the right direction. I'm not going to make any promises. Um, it, you know, it's taken us two years just to get our heads around ideas that we came up with 25 years ago. And so it's not an easy thing. And one of the biggest challenges isn't even just conceptualizing it. It's articulating it. It's explaining it to other people in a way they understand in the same way we have heterogeneous circumscriptions of taxon concepts. We have heterogeneous language and, and ideas about what we're talking about. So even just having conversations about this stuff is challenging. But I would say that I'm more optimistic now that there is light at the end of the tunnel, that we are moving in the right direction. And the symposium that's happening tomorrow is, is talking about moving beyond these old 20 year old arguments about names versus concepts. So I, I, I'm not gonna put a year to it, but I would say, perhaps we're in our last decade of arguing about it. So within the decade, by the end of the 2020s, maybe we should get to the point where GBIF and Catalog of Life and Worms and all the big data aggregators finally have realized this utopian dream of being linked behind the scenes so that you can crosswalk the data to each other seamlessly, allow for multiple parallel tax taxonomies reflecting different legitimate uh, classifications and Deb seems to like that. <laughs> um, but that's where we're heading towards. We know it's technically possible. The barriers are mostly social, but we're overcoming those social barriers, I think. Perfect. Thank you. Is anyone in the audience? Well, oh, Nikki. Maybe I'll run down to you. <laughs> Thank you. So in the in the spirit of including our virtual colleagues, I, I tweeted my question. So I'll I'll read it out as well. So um Actually, while I'm reading it out, 
it was about your slide where you're showing the uh, the world of nomenclature and taxonomy versus the real world. Okay. So I wonder, could you flip back and find that? Yeah, there was a couple of those, cool. but um, the one with the map or the one before the, the map? One just before the map, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Nikki Nicholson. Uh, I'm from Kew. I've got a background in uh, as a technical person on the IPNI project, which uh, is kind of the botanical equivalent of a lot of what Rich has been talking about. So that's uh, that's an introduction to me. Is that the one you meant? That's cool. Yes, okay. that's the one I meant. So uh, it's kind of a keynote type question. So I guess it's fair to say that nomenclature and taxonomy often feel a bit invisible. Mm -hmm. but from the perspective of the rest of the sciences, who may be taken a bit for granted as a service. Um, and I suppose I've been involved in Tadwick for quite a few years. Not so great at my first Tadwick. <laughs> um, <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> yeah, we, I think we've done a lot of work on better service in the contributions of people yes. that are traditionally hidden. But there's a lot of hidden work yes. in that slide. Yes. Um, so there's like all the people that did the collecting of these specimens. There's the people that curate them. And then there's like going up into the informatics realm, there's all the research software engineers that help build all these things. So could you comment on how that, you know, us better recognizing all, all those kind of efforts? Do you think that's going to affect how we model and develop taxonomy in the future? Yeah, so that's really key. And, and you and I have been talking about this for years uh, as well. But basically, there are these unsung heroes that you've never heard of who have done decades and decades of work. And those unsung heroes are actually in different communities. Uh, one of the ones I think you're referring to are the developers and the programmers and the people like at Q and, and, and me and in and, and Zubank and things like that, who just spend tireless hours and evenings and weekends. And, and in fact, a lot of these catalogers of, of names like Bill Eschmeyer and a lot of others spent their entire lives, you know, Charles Davies Sherborne recommitted himself to this. So these are like these unsung heroes in, who, who essentially aggregate the information. And, and that's, a, that's an amazingly challenging and difficult thing that is so broadly underappreciated by people who, who aren't living in that world. There's another sphere of um, underappreciated heroes behind all of this, which are the people actually out in the field, you know, the collectors. Um, if you go to places like New Guinea, people who live there understand their biodiversity way better than any Westerner understands the biodiversity they live in. Uh, and, and there are so many names of people who have brought knowledge to the scientific four that get sort of forgotten over time. And, and a lot of those are like just the collectors of specimens. And then of course, there's the taxonomists in between who are trying to synthesize all of this information. I think that's what makes it so challenging. It is every tier from original discovery and encountering a new species or a specimen in the field, all the way up to having it show up when you search, you know, in IPNI to find that name and all the relevant metadata associated with it. So much work has gone into that. And it's not particularly conducive to auto, uh, to, to um, artificial intelligence. Maybe we can get better at it. I think we can get better software tools to to increase, you know, to lubricate the machinery of making that workflow work. But there's just, I think in taxonomy in particular, people just don't appreciate, you know, everyone complains about how long it takes and how, you know, how much effort there is and why are we still working on this for decades? Because it requires a lot of work. And there's been some funding, but nowhere near enough funding to actually meet that challenge. I don't know, Nikki, is that kind of what you wanted me to comment on? Or is there something more specific you want me to get at? <laughs> Sorry. Giving it back, sorry. I, no, that, could you that, comment on it? <laughs> that is true, but I guess that is um, they're the people we know about. I guess I'm kind of interested in the the unknown unknowns. Like, the, you know, how do we how do we make sure that we're including all the people that we need to include? Right, not just the people we know. Right, that's a really good question. I'm not the right one to answer it, but Tadwig kind of plays a role in yeah. trying to find those people and engage them. Um, they include people who don't even know, you know, who aren't plugged into this world like these naturalists in Papua New Guinea, who have this enormous body of knowledge that goes way beyond what Western science does. And, you know, their entire cultures are disappearing and their entire, you know, knowledge base is disappearing. That's not my area of expertise, so I don't really have a whole lot to comment on, but I want people to acknowledge that it's not just the scientists and the informaticians and everybody. It, it's just this amazing collective humanity of, of insight and knowledge over centuries that 
you know, we could empower that if we could only work out this this technical infrastructure of names and nomenclature and taxonomy and 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 shine a spotlight on those you know hidden dark corners of knowledge that are forgotten or, or at risk of being forgotten. And on that note, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Pavel. Um, we'll be meeting outside in now having morning tea. <laughs>